Warm welcome from Education Design Architects. Saturday evening may not be a very good idea to have a formal gathering like this. But then I really thank one and all for coming down to make this evening. Today we are here to listen Prakash Naya share his views on a new paradigm for education. Prakash is an US based architect and the co founder of Fielding Naya International and Education Design Architects India. He is the recipient of the topmost individual honor for education design. He is also the author of one of the leading books, The Language of School Design. He is a keynote speaker, design principal, in charge in 39 countries across five continents. Now I would like to request Prakash Naya to come up and share his views on education design. Thank you, Shilpa. Um, assume everybody can hear me? Yeah. Okay, again, th thanks for coming. I just want to um, say briefly that the first thanks again, as Shilpa said, Saturday evening, you know, not maybe the best place, but particularly since you're hearing the music back there, and I would want to be there rather than here. Um, also, I noticed that we are on Indian stretchable time. I kind of had forgotten about that since, you know, but uh, that's okay. And uh, as Shilpa said, our practice was not expanded to 39 countries, so clearly there's a hunger for a whole new way to look at education across the world. Now, as far as India is concerned, India has literally in some ways at a crossroads because India, um, having jumped into the fray a little bit later, has two choices. India can either follow what the rest of the world is doing, particularly the Western world, which tends to be sometimes a practice with the, what used to be called the developing countries, and India I don't think can even fall into that category anymore, was to just kind of copy what the West was doing. Right? That's one model, if you will. And the second model is to leapfrog the West completely and just sort of say, look, you know, we're not going to copy what you're doing, we're, we're going to just jump right over. Now this actually happened with technology a lot. Um, I was, it was curious, when I was in New York, uh, Bipin, as a matter of fact, had broadband access in Kerala faster than I got it in New York City. So, um, because New York had so much infrastructure, um, they had to overcome that before new infrastructure could be introduced, whereas in India, we didn't have, we didn't have that problem. So, I think that we need to keep that in mind when we look at education. In the United States, uh, the educational structure is far more built up than it's in India. So India has a chance to do things that maybe the US may not have a chance to do. So what I'm going to point out to you here are some of the universal principles of good uh, design and good education. And I hope that India, or I hope that India will, <laughs> where should I stand? Yeah. Um, will we'll, uh, be smart enough not to blindly copy uh, what, say, the U.S. is doing. I mean, the U.S. is certainly not a country that I would want to copy anything from, certainly not in the world of education. In fact, the U.S. is actually backtracking uh, over the last, I think, since the Bush administration, they have gone back in time. But the good news is that a lot of the good ideas about education actually began in the United States. So in that sense, I think we can still take the lead uh, from, from, from there. But, um, so anyway, so that's kind of a little background, and uh, here's an opportunity. Now, in realizing what India is doing, and, and realizing a lot of people are jumping into the education market uh, in, in, uh, in India, unfortunately, greatly from a business standpoint, I'm not necessarily seeing that you can have very, it can be a really good business, but even a better business if, in fact, you're actually doing education right. So I think that's a piece. It's kind of like a Hindi movie. I mean, all the movies, all the stories are the same, but they spend, you know, tens of millions of dollars on the production. So I was, I always think if they can spend just a little bit more on the story, right, the movie is going to be so much more successful. Uh, it's, it's, it's that's a, that's a basic thing. So it's the same idea here that the really most important thing about education is the concept of education itself. But people spend a ton of money, and, and I've even seen schools that have marble in the bathrooms and things like that. And that's not has nothing to do with education. So let's focus on what's really important. So here I think is a good place to start. I'm going to play this little video. I hope you can hear it. Just call it baby.
The reason I play that obviously is because that's our client. That's the client of education, right? And what kind of a school does this client of education go to? The schools that these clients of our credit clients of education go to look exactly the same, at least from the perspective of how education is conducted as it looked 50 years, maybe one might even argue 100 years ago. So there's a lot of catching up to do in the world of education. The world has changed a lot, but the world of education has not caught up at all. And it seems to be this huge, huge opportunity that's out there, but people seem reluctant to jump into that place. And so people like us who <coughs> were brave enough to jump in, there's a lot of demand for us, which is kind of unfortunate because they shouldn't be. I mean, this should be pretty common sense. This should be something that everybody understands and everybody does, right? But like when it comes to it, like if you were, if, unfortunately, if one of them had a sick relative or something, you wouldn't go to the hospital and say, please treat my child the way you treated my grandparents, right? You would never ask for that. And yet, you will hear parents say all the time, look, this education system worked for me, and so I wanted, I'm wanted. i sure it will work for my, my child. So when it comes to the education of your children, somehow it's okay to do things the way your grandparents did it. And somehow that seems to give parents comfort to see the same thing. For example, there's a, there's a misimpression uh, out there that if kids are having fun, then they must not be learning anything, right? There are lots of these myths that are floating around which have absolutely nothing to do with the research about how we learn, but more importantly have nothing to do with the research about the skills that we need to do well in the 21st century. Now, of course, uh, in places like the United States, the road jobs that the education prepared you for, the sort of menial jobs, the factory jobs, have gone away. Right? So the U.S. is actually stuck right now with no choice but to educate the citizens in a different way if, in fact, you want to, we want to preserve our middle class there. India is in a different position. India still has many of those menial jobs. But still, I think a parent would say, given a choice, I'd rather have my, my, my child or my, you know, at, even when they grow up, do something that's more meaningful, that's more enjoyable, rather than a menial job, even though that menial job might exist. But the reality is that the focus on test scores and examinations and the sort of notion that that's education is, in fact, going to create a, um, a situation where, yeah, you might have hundreds of millions of educated people, but they're not really educated. They're just skilled in, in some ways. And with the world changing as rapidly as it has, and as I said, with, with India poised to leapfrog Western um, democracies and others, it's, it's really a huge, huge opportunity for India because India doesn't have that infrastructure that these Western countries have built. And so you, we here, and I say you because I'm actually dual citizen, um, we can, in fact, um, move in the right direction. So again, what percent of children worldwide are stuck in an obsolete model of education? Based upon all the stuff that I said, I think it's going to be quite obvious when I tell you 99% plus. Is they say there's a big lies are easier to sell. Because the lie is so big, and so many hundreds of millions of people are participating in it, that it becomes an easy to easy lie to sell. Because it's, well, how could it be? If, if a billion people are doing it, it must be right, right. But the reality is that it's wrong, regardless of how many people are doing it. The thing that we call education fundamentally is flawed. It's based on a, uh, on a premise, or a fundamental foundational premise, that is wrong. Okay? And I'll show you why. Let's, let's put, take the classroom, for example. Basically, that's the place our kids are actually being educated, right? I and mean, a significant portion of our kids' time is spent in the classroom. And so if the classroom is flawed, then by definition, the entire model of education has to be flawed. And what I'm, my, the thesis I'm making, ah, familiar faces. <laughs> Just want to pause for a minute to, to say I have very important guests that have joined. IK, Indu, Omi, and Tanuja. Uh, they are my, my family. In fact, other than my parents, I think they are the people that I'm closest to. So very happy to see them here in the front row. <laughs> oh, don't worry. This is the Indian Stretchable Times, so actually. We just started. So, so anyway, so the notion of why is the classroom obsolete, right? So if it is obsolete, then clearly the entire model of education worldwide, with 99 plus uh, percent plus, we're doing something wrong with all of those kids. So the, here's the reason, because the input, the students that go, come into school are variable. No two students are the, are the same. Just because they're the same age doesn't make them the same. Some of them are boys, some of them are girls, they have different 
passions, different interests, different aptitudes, that de develop at different rates. So that's a variable, that's a given. No, even a parent who has two kids will say, my two children are not exactly the same. So we know that if you have 20 or 25 students in a classroom, they must be different. That's a given. The curriculum, we are saying, well, everybody must learn the same thing. So we're fixing the curriculum, right? And then we're saying the time that we're going to give you to learn that curriculum, also we're going to fix. So if you have variable input, and you're fixing the curriculum, and you're fixing the time, then you have to get variable output. By definition, some students are going to learn more, and some students are going to learn less. Right? Now here's an interesting part. When you talk about exams, for example, there's do exams on something called a curve. And what that means is that half of the students are going to fail. Right? Because you say, well, above average, below average. What does that mean? It means that some students are going to do exceptionally well, some students are going to do very badly, and most of the students are going to be the average in the middle. No parent wants to send their kid to school to be below average, right? I mean, how many parents would say, the reason I selected school is so that my kid can be below average? And yet, half of the students will be below average. So we've designed a system where half of the students are going to fail. That seems to be a silly idea. How can, can you imagine a factory where half of the products fail? And yet here we are, our kids, our most precious possession, we have designed a system where half of them, by definition, are going to fail. So I want to talk about these four primordial learning metaphors because um, hopefully we're going to engage in at least a few of those. One metaphor that you're seeing now is called the campfire. The campfire form of learning is where a lecture is being given. That it's one to many. In other words, an expert storyteller is talking. So we say the glow of the LCD projector is a place of glow of the campfire, but what I'm doing right now, I'm in a campfire mode. You guys are all sitting quiet. You have, unfortunately, no choice but to listen to me. Uh, actually, you do. You can always raise your hand and let us get into what we call mode at any point, and that's not a problem. So that's kind of the campfire mode of learning that you see in school. Unfortunately, you see too much of this in school, where the teacher is completely in charge and controlling, controlling the room. Right? And then you have something called the walking hall, which is where if I were to stop lecturing and you were to just go off and start having dinner and you start talking to each other, that's the social learning that happens and that's called water for learning. And, then, and that's what you might look like in school. And then you have the K form, which is where we learn independently, where we learn from ourselves. And that's very, very important. In fact, the majority of the creative think, thinking that happens in people's lives happens in the cave, where you're on your own. People talk about brainstorming and all these modern management techniques, but the reality is, that the majority of creative thinking happens when you're on your own. That's just something we have to keep in mind. And finally, we have life, which is where you get to try things out. So this lecture, by the way, I'm just telling you up front, is completely useless. If you heard this lecture, had some dinner and went home, it would have zero meaning for you, absolutely no meaning. But if you took something out of it, you talked about it with your friends and colleagues, you decided to do something about it, and you went out and actually used it in some way, now, thought about it by yourself, said, well, how can I use that information this guy gave? And then next day you went and actually did something with it and brought it to life. Then you have completed the cycle of learning. Now, if you look at schools, you see very little, you almost see no cave. I mean, where do kids ever get a chance to retreat in school? Nothing. You see almost very, very little life going on. It's all theory. There's very little application, real-world applications going on. So really, most of the time you see it, and even the watering hole is where you tell the children to stop, don't talk. I mean, children are rewarded for not talking, not socializing, right? And they get a recess, a few minutes here and there, where they're supposed to socialize. And so the socializing even that happens on the margins, which is, so that means campfires are dominant. So you really don't have a balanced system when it comes to school, right off the bat. So now, when it comes to schools, people talk about 21st century schools, and, so well, what does that all mean with the world changing so rapidly? It's very simple. There are 20 fundamental ways in which we can learn. And those fundamental ways of learning, which all reflect back to these four, so I'm sure you're not going to remember the 20, so at least you, you can take home those four, are all things that we need to see happening in school. So for example, you want to see independent study. You want to see peer tutoring. Uh, you want to keep, see team collaboration. You want to see one-on-one -on -one learning with a teacher. You want to see lectures. You want to see project-based learning. You want to see learning with mobile technology. And, distance learning and internet-based research, presentations by students and performances, and learning in a circle, and interdisciplinary, and learning from nature, and social and emotional developing of students, art, storytelling, uh, designing things. And then the teachers need to be working in teams as well, and finally play, right? Now, of course, most schools, if you go to, you'll see most of these things happening. Here's a big problem with that. Those things are all happening in different places. That's a big problem. 
because learning isn't something that can be segmented and marginalized and say, well, here, now you're going to be in this mode, and now you're going to be in that mode, and now that's kind of what happens in school. Let's all go to the computer lab, or let's go to the science lab, or let's go to the gym. And that's not how human beings live. So what we need is to take these 20 forms of learning, and we need to make it seamless. That is, let's say if I'm a teacher now, and I have a class of 25 students, I need to be able to say, well, these three guys already get it. There's no need for them to waste their time in my classroom. I can send them somewhere where they can do advanced research. And these three, you know, I think that they can actually maybe teach the class while I help this other one child, you know, who needs expert, uh, extra help. And these two can help each other, or this person can do research. Whatever it is, from those 20 months of learning, the teacher should be able to select, select freely whatever mode of learning he or she wants and be able to implement that. You can't do that in a traditional classroom design model because you're stuck in that box and you're stuck with all 20 and you're trying to deliver the same um, uh, fixed curriculum to this variable group of students, which is why some students act up and they throw spit balls or whatever it is that they do in India. But certainly it's not learning. You know? In fact, if we were at the American School of Bombay where I asked the kids, how much time do you actually spend focusing on what teacher says? And they said, well, we're probably distracted about 60% of the time. And they were honest enough to say that. And this is supposedly over top of school, right? And that's true, because we can't focus and concentrate for hours and hours and hours and hours. Imagine if I were just talking to you like this for six hours. How, how much time do you, how much of your attention could I hold, right? So here's a, a key thing. Uh, this is a computer, it was, it was the Apple IIe. In fact, it was my first computer. I bought this in 1982, I think. And it, the, the innovation about this computer was that it had lower case. And that was a big deal in those days, because all computers had the uppercase. So here are some of the things you could do. We could do word processing, spreadsheets, databases. I could even connect uh, through modems. I, I, could, I thought it was a, the best, hugely, I mean, wonderful invention, right? But then, 2011 comes around, and look at all the things we can do. But look at this, the thing in the middle. That's the hardware that has allowed us to do ultra-fast broadband, Google, YouTube, eBay, all these apps, and Skype, and you know, e-books and all this kind of stuff is now possible because of all that hardware, right? Now just imagine if that hardware hadn't been there. Just imagine that we were still stuck with the Apple IIe. How much of that innovation do you think we could, we would have today? I guess we could still carry the big Apple IIe hanging around our necks and we could still text from it if we can figure out some way to, some battery that would allow it to keep going. But the reality is that that computer was not designed. It didn't have the processing power. It didn't have any of the stuff that you need. We have computers my telephone, my, my, my Blackberry is about a million times more powerful than that computer, right? So here's the problem. Schools, 1970, 2011, pretty much the same. So here's the question, what are we missing? We're missing something, right? Because obviously the world has come a long way since 1970. Something has to have happened in all of this time. And yet, somehow or the other, we are assuming that the hardware, the physical hardware of school, which hasn't changed, is going to accommodate that change world, which seems kind of crazy if you think about it from a just common sense standpoint. And yet you'll find schools, brand new schools designed today, in fact, 99% of schools, I can to 99% of schools being built in India today, follow that same traditional model. Maybe they don't look like that, maybe they're new paint, and maybe there's nice, little slightly nicer furniture, whatever, but the basic model of a kid's going in and sitting in a box and being lectured to for X number of hours hasn't changed. And by the way, the amount of space a kid gets in that box is less space than you would give to a prisoner in a high security prison. I mean, it's, it's, it's a miracle that these kids are not actually going completely berserk and you know, doing some really crazy things. And I guess the reason for that is we've hammered them into submission. Over 11 or 12 years, we've got them to comply. It's like, like a monkey, like you can train a monkey to do a lot of things. And we kind of kids coming into school totally, I mean, totally eager, totally excited. Uh, you know, they are gregarious, they are, they are, they are challenge authority, they are happy to talk to you, you know, they, they have all the skills that we would consider leadership skills, they have all the 21st century skills, they're also creative, right? They're, there's no problem that they will consider not solvable. They'll jump on it and they'll try it. They don't mind if their art doesn't look great, but they'll show it to you, right? And what do we do? We, we as Ken Robinson said, we educated the creativity out of them. By the time 12 years roll around, boom, that's it. You know, they become automatons. And of course, we, we, we uh, praise a very narrow band of intelligence uh, you know, the test taking skills, the examination skills, and we call them smarter. So the rest of the population thinks they're stupid, but in fact they're not stupid. I mean, some of the greatest names we know, from Steve Jobs, to Stephen King, to Richard Branson, to George Lucas, all these people never went to college, they never completed college. But they are, they are billionaires, many of them, right? Because we know that being smart and 
being book smart are completely different things. And yet we have narrowed this tiny uh, slice of intelligence. In fact, there is evidence that IQ only accounts for about 4 to 6% of career success. 4 to 6%. And that's what we are focusing so much on, IQ. But in fact, EQ, which is emotional intelligence, has a far greater significance. People who have good social skills are far more likely to succeed in life than people who are just, um, you know, cerebrally smart. So what is it then? So when you talk about 20, and I mean, it's unfortunate that I have to even use the term 21st century because we are in the 21st century, right? And we shouldn't be talking 20th versus 21st century because, hey, we are already here. Why are we even talking about the 20th century? And the only reason I'm talking about it is because education is the one enterprise that's stuck in the 20th century. So I'm forced to talk about that, and you'll see from the comparisons whether or not the schools that you're familiar with are 20th century or 21st century. Okay, so let's start with uh, 20th century education is time-bound. It's all based upon how much time someone spends in a classroom. It says, okay, science, you have to attend the X number of lectures in a, in a week. And there's a, even the CBSE will let you specifically tell you how many lectures and how many periods you're supposed to attend. As if it said, some magical number is there that if you attend so many science classes, you will become a scientist or you will become an expert in that particular field, right? But the 21st century is outcome bound. And the, by the way, the designs that you see on the left, on the other side, well, that's left, are really, uh, many of them are our, our schools that we've done. So you can see, outcome bound simply means we don't really care how much time you spend doing something. What we're interested in is, have you learned it? That's the only thing that we're concerned about. You may spend no time learning, doing it. That's fine with us as long as you have learned what it is that you're supposed to learn, right? Um, 20th century is memorization of facts. I mean, right now, I mean, with my Blackberry on my, on my waist, now I can challenge anybody on facts. So, big deal if somebody knows a lot of stuff, because I know more than them. I can, I can look up the latest information, latest data anywhere in the world, and constantly connect it to the entire encyclopedia, all of human knowledge I'm connected to with a click of, of my Blackberry. And I trust that a lot more than some guy's memory, no matter how good his memory may be, right? So, so much for that. So now the question is, what can students, what can students know? I mean, knowing meaning a deep understanding, and what can they do with that knowledge? Again, if you see the room on the right, um, right, left, <laughs> what is that for you? It's your right, okay. You can see that it looks very different for the same reason. This school, by the way, is from Azerbaijan, which we were invited to Azerbaijan to write their national design standards. And we said, well, if this is how you educate kids, then you know, then it's not going to work. So we basically help them rewrite their design standards more for the other kind of education. So really we have something called Bloom's taxonomy, which comes from the 1950s, which basically says that, I'm actually being somewhat generous here, really Bloom's taxonomy for the 20th century is just remembering, right? If you remember the stuff and you can spit it out on an exam and you do it on an exam, everybody's happy. That's it, right? But there's all this other stuff called what we call 21st century, which is understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating, and don't forget the most important concept, giving something back to society, right? All of those things are what 21st century is about. And what we're saying is it's not enough to just remember something and spit it on a test. You have to go beyond that. And not simply because it sounds good, because those are the skills that are going to be important for our kids to be successful. And, then, and I use the word success in a different way. I use the word success uh, synonymous with happiness for them to be fulfilled and for them to feel a sense of accomplishment. You need, they need to be educated in that way. And you can't do that in the traditional school. So here's this, I'm not stacking these images so that it looks like I'm showing the 20th century as being bad and the 21st century as being great. This is actually an image from a school that was recently completed in Detroit in the United States at $145 million. And here's a classroom, which is a traditional, this classroom could have been taken from the 1950. And, and it's a room with no windows by the way, you do notice. And there's a reason why you need windows. There's a whole science behind, behind that. Just adding windows to this classroom can increase the level of learning going on in this classroom substantially, just at one factor alone. Leave alone the fact that they're sitting in a faculty model school there. So research-based means that learning and information is more dynamic as opposed to more static. So passive learning versus active learning. And many of these school images from the right are right, from the left are actually from high-end, expensive, private schools. Learners isolated in classrooms. Learners work collaboratively and with peers around the world. Classrooms set up for direct instruction where the teacher is totally in charge. And you can see the teacher standing in front of the room and all the kids are facing the teacher. And 21st century classrooms set up for multiple forms of learning. And you can see the teacher is hard to see. Teachers right in the front working with a group of kids. Other kids are working on their own. There's a kid in a, in a, in a rocking chair back there. Some kids working on the floor. 
And I noticed the blackboard has been lowered so everybody can write on it. It's a democratic classroom where the, the, the blackboard is for everybody, for everybody to present, everybody to write on, to use as a resource. So the curriculum is fragmented, math, science, English, social studies, as if you ever encounter that in the real world. You never encounter math in the real world in the way it's been taught in school. You never encounter English in the real world the way it's been taught in school. And yet, you don't feel, because everything in the world is connected. Everything in the world is connected. So you can't fragment the curriculum because if you do, don't expect kids to be able to put it all together when they are adults. They don't. They just can't put it together. And that's why we have all the, the biggest problems in the world today, from global warming to the wars and all of this. All of these have been caused by people with PhDs and master's degrees and all that, because they're all coming from this education model, right? When we had a Holocaust in Germany, Germany was considered to be one of the most educated countries, most cultured countries, and yet they were missing the human element. They were missing the component of uh, morality and thinking and all of those kinds of things, which is what a holistic education would be all about. So more interdisciplinary work, more theory, more practice. Very interesting, this teacher is standing in a, in a marketing classroom, supposedly helping teach students to become good entrepreneurs, and she has computers set up uh, in, a, in a way that the teacher can see the computers because God forbid that students should do something that the teacher should not control, right? So she wants complete control over the classroom. And yet, in that same school, kids are working in a kitchen with butcher knives. So because that's old technology that the adults are familiar with, so they don't have a problem giving kids these knives, but they do have a problem giving kids uh, computers because they don't know enough about them, so they need to control that. So less teacher collaboration, more teacher collaboration. By the way, when teachers work more with each other, students do better. There's research from Stanford University, which just published this year, that said that when teachers work as a team, the students do better. So giving teachers an opportunity to work with each other is the best way to make sure education, your kids are being educated. Um, print is a primary vehicle. So you have to assess kids based upon what they have produced in writing. That's it. Whereas 21st century, students' performances are important. Uh, projects that they do, the portfolios that they create, all of these things are measured. So we're not saying assessment isn't important in the 21st century, but you assess different things. You have 20th century centralized technology, it's like you have to go to the computer as if the computer is something that you learn, as opposed to the computer being integral to everything that you do. Whereas 21st century is all about dispersing technology. 20th century outdoors are not taken advantage of. India is a great of, of a, a country where we can pretty much use the outdoors, uh, you know, 12 months of the year, and yet you see so little use of the outdoors. Whereas 21st century, the outdoors are designed for informal learning and for environmental science, and it's less expensive, it's more fun, kids have um, a better time being outdoors, more sustainable, and kids end up being more healthy as well. So the focus of the 20th century is efficiency, and we thought that putting people in classrooms, small boxes, with a little corridor there makes it more efficient. But the reality is that if you're measuring efficiency from the perspective of how much students have learned, then it's a very inefficient model, very, very inefficient model. So the 21st century focuses on effectiveness. We don't really care about being, we, we measure efficiency and effectiveness in the same way. So even, even this image on the, okay, this uh, has hallways, which takes up significant part of the, of the space. On the right, those hallways are now used for teaching and learning. So that means that it's a better way of doing it. It's in fact more efficient and also more effective. So here are some of the schools we did, and I'll flip through. This is a school in, in, in uh, Minneapolis called Restore. The, the population of kids coming to the school are coming from very poor families, and basically about 20% of the kids in this demographic used to graduate from school. Although, although the rest of them went on to gangs and violence and jails and all that kind of stuff. So this population, once they start coming to the school, now they graduate more than 99% of the kids. And almost all of them are going on to colleges. Many of them are going to colleges with full scholarships. So that's a huge difference. So we're not talking about marginal improvements of going from 20% to 25%. We're talking about paradigm shifting changes, right? And how does that happen? Because students are not empowered. Every student in this school has a job. They, they spend only four days in the school, and the fifth day they're actually out in the, in the uh, world working in a real job, getting paid real money, which of course goes to school to pay their tuition, so they don't get to keep the money. But that's part of the model here. And you can see this is this is the way we designed the school where we basically said, okay, you guys have to have an opportunity to do things beyond just sit in a classroom. You have to be able to do things on your own. So you can see this is that like, remember how cafeterias look like in school? It's this place that you like you're feeding cattle. Whereas here, it's decentralized. 
it's less expensive model, but students are eating on demand when they need to, where they need to. So the cafe function has been decentralized completely. And you can see here, students here just sit there, they can talk, they can work, just like adults. You know, we're treating them with respect and then they behave that way. They behave like adults. They don't act up, they don't destroy the school. You don't have to act as if they're a bunch of animals that we have to control, right? And you can see, so it means that these are, as I said, high-risk kids, kids who are in danger of dropping out, kids who have serious social problems, serious emotional problems coming from you know, homes that are damaged and stuff like that. We do have lectures. I'm not saying that lecture is a bad form of learning, but it has to be done in moderation. This is some uh, schools in Jackson uh, Elementary in uh, Medford, and I'm going to quickly flip through some of those images just to give you a sense of how um, schools designed according to the model that I'm talking about look different. Most of these schools, by the way, even on the traditional test scores, they they do far better. So as I give you the example of those kids graduating and going on to college, it's not a selection between do I want to do it on an exam or do I, do, do I want my kid to be happy? No, if your kid is happy, they're going to do better on the exam and they're going to learn more because this kind of learning is much more deep. It's deep understanding. You don't have to be sitting in an examination about trying to figure out something that you memorized because the understanding is much deeper. So the kids actually do much better on the exams in these schools as well. So don't think of this as a choice. So obviously these images are physical images. The reason I'm showing the physical images is that go back to that hardware-software equation, right? If you make the hardware for the factory model, then the education will be factory model. If you make the hardware for the software model, for the non-21st century model, then the education has an opportunity to be 21st century. I'm not saying that just because you make the hardware 21st century, automatically the teachers are going to know what to do. You need to do professional development, you need to work with them, you need to work with your parent community and, and find out what it is that you really want to do. But you can see grandparents, they're a great resource, why don't we use them in school? Right? Community is a great resource, why don't we use them? Why are we building everything in the school when we can go out and use some community resources? That's a great field trip for kids, whether it's a public park or a YMCA or any of the various amenities that are available. Let kids use those things. Those are connecting you to the real world and it costs less money to build the school as well. Artwork display, transparency, and of course we involve our, when we do our schools, we involve parents, we involve the community, we involve all the stakeholders as well, because it's very important that, that everybody be involved. It's not like we can come in and tell somebody how to do education. It has to be there. They have to take ownership of it. And kids are very much involved as well. We have 300 students in this school working with us on designing their school, because it's their school, right? Somebody has to speak for that. Uh, this is a school that right literally behind my home in, in Florida, which is one of our clients. And you can see a lot of the stuff happens outdoors. This is a very outdoors-based school. In fact, half of the time these kids spend outside. There's only about 50% of the time that they spend in the classroom. There's a mice in the kids' hands. And this used to be classrooms. We just ripped all those walls down and this kind of learning. You walk into this space, you think that our kids can't be self-directed. There's tremendous amount of uh, um, uh, self-direction going on. It's not noisy, it's not acoustically bad. None of that stuff that everybody got afraid is going to happen is happening. And this is one of the most successful schools in the entire state of Florida. So we're not talking about somehow some sort of an experiment with kids you know, who are doing something different kind of thing. No, we're talking about kids who are exceptionally successful and the schools are very, very, very successful. In fact, now we're doing a high school for these kids, and I'll show you a little bit about that. So we're doing a high school for them, so we moved them to a temporary facility, and this is actually a call center. Call center went out of business, because who wants a call center in the United States when you can do one in India? It's a lot cheaper, I guess. So it was not a very good idea to begin with, but that's what it was before. So the building was lying vacant, and we said, well, we'll use it as a school. And guess what? We did nothing. We basically inherited this space and said, can be used as it is. Don't do much with this. I told the principal, do not do anything with this school building because it doesn't look like a school and that's its greatest asset. So this is what it looks like. Kids came in, the parents helped clean up the place and now it's a school. Um, you can see that's what school is supposed to, that's what a 21st century school is supposed to look like. Where kids are basically doing the work and the job of the adult is to be a facilitator, to be the one giving the guidance, not to be the one doing what I'm doing, which is fine for 30 minutes, but not, not good for six or seven hours, 12, 12 years out of their life. So, so these are images from that place that used to be the call center. It's also connected to the 
outside if you get scared. Our first point of bed based learning. So basically, if you were to take the problem, of course, is a lot of these schools have already built. So the question is, what would happen if you were to take a 20th century school building, and how would you convert it to make it the 21st century? So we did this in Brussels, in International School of Brussels. We took an old, high, old building, and we put a temporary high school in there while we're building the new high school for them. And as it turns out, the temporary high school is so good that the school decided to keep it, and now they're going to increase the enrollment of the school. But I'll show you what we did with that. We took a traditional building, and here's what we changed, how we changed it to a 21st century design. So that's what the traditional building looked like, a bunch of classrooms along a corridor, right? Okay, Sorry. classroom model goes away, those walls come down. By the way, the structure hasn't changed. It's the exact same structure as before, so it's not like we have to spend a lot of money fixing this. Stuff like this can be done very inexpensively. And remember again, go back to those 20 models of learning. Remember all the things that kids and teachers and adults need to do. And in this space, think about this space of what will let you do versus those classrooms that you saw earlier. Now, the space in the middle there is configured as a presentation space, as you can see. That presentation space can go away, literally, and that space can become something else. That same furniture can be reconfigured for collaborative learning. What looks like two learning studios, which are places for that look kind of like classrooms, but are more than classrooms because you can do a lot more in those learning studios, um, can go away. And those rooms can now become one larger space when students are in a self-directed mode, and those rooms can now become one larger space, and then we have these glass garage doors that just lift up, and that space then becomes connected to the larger common space because we are not doing direct instruction there anymore. And when you go into direct instruction mode, of course, you can close those doors. So this is what used to be the corridor has looks like looks like this now, um, with um, furnishings, different kinds of furnishings, different kinds of um, setups to have various group sizes of groupings. Uh, breakout areas, and yet it's completely supervisable, right? So teachers don't have the fear to send kids out there because they can be easily supervised. So that's essentially the difference between what you would call a 20th century and 21st century. So now let's quick, take a quick look at higher ed. Is higher ed doing any better? And the answer is yes, it is doing better, yet, yet the higher education establishment is also stuck in the old model. And I want to play this. This is Professor Levin, and he is a, I would, I will uh, play this lecture to think for you. He's, he's a very popular lecturer in MIT. And the way he does it, he's very entertaining. The students love him, and they come, and, and you can so watch, watch this lecture, and then we'll talk a little bit about his model. So I trust demonstration. the conservation of carrier energy for 100%. I may not trust myself. I'm going to release this object. And I hope I will be able to do it at zero speed. So that when it comes back, it may touch my chin, but it may not crush my chin. I want you to be extremely quiet, because this is no joke. If I don't succeed in giving it zero speed, then this will be my last lecture. <laughs> Three, two, one, zero. If a student says, I find physics boring and dull, it simply means only one thing, that they had a bad teacher. Any good teacher can turn physics into something absolutely spectacular. And this powerful rocket is enough to reach the escape velocity of... <laughs> I almost reached the escape velocity, but I crashed. See you next Friday. <coughs>
I have 100 demonstrations that I do in uh, 600 demonstrations in about 100 lectures. Some are more challenging than others. There is not just one that I can say is the super duper most difficult one of all. Many are very complicated. Many are not even without personal risk. You have to prepare them very well not to get hurt. You have to prepare them very well to be successful. I rehearse every lecture three times in real time with an empty classroom, with empty blackboards, and I write on the blackboards everything that I would be writing down during my lecture. And that takes about 40 hours per lecture. And of those 40 hours, there are three dry runs involved. Three complete, full-time dry runs. Why do demonstrations? Because students love it. It's the best way to get the idea across. Okay. Okay, now, our perception of that is a wonderful teacher, Fred. I mean, who would say that he's not a great teacher? Anybody here say that he's not a great teacher? Who wouldn't want to have him as your teacher at MIT? Like, entertaining, the guys saying all the great things, and all of that, right? So here's, here's a slight problem with that. Let me actually... <laughs> Okay, so, so the result of all of that thing that you saw Professor Levin do is that attended Saturday's lectures fell 40% by the end of the term and 14% failed the course. Are you surprised by this? I guess we should be surprised, right? Because that is our expectation of what a great teacher is. He is a great teacher. He's taken so much pains. He practices lecture. He is dedicated. His students love him. And yet his students were doing horribly. And the reason is very simple, right? And it's common sense. Imagine this, imagine you're attending a concert by an incredibly great pianist. You sit there, you're totally entertained, you love it. Are you going to go home and become a pianist yourself because you did that? Imagine you're watching the great, your, your football hero or such and and you're watching this, you're great, you enjoy it, and you say, wow, I had such a great time. Does that make you a great cricketer? You see what I'm saying? That's the concept. We are under the impression that because we watched this great lecture, that somehow it translates into learning. Learning has nothing to do with observing somebody do a great thing. I mean, Professor Levin is wonderful at what he does. He's an expert. There's no question about it. But the students, they're just watching. They're warriors, right? They're not in any way directly involved in what he's doing. And the fact that they are so engrossed in what he's doing, the fact that they are so captivated by it, makes them feel, gives them a false sense of security that they have learned something. Now, imagine if you were a bad lecturer. If you had been a horrible lecturer, they would have felt so worried that they hadn't learned anything, that they would have gone home and done something, and then they would have learned something, right? So in fact, they are being punished by the fact that he's so good as a lecturer, because he's an entertainer is what he is. He's not a lecturer. He's not a teacher. There's a big difference. So this is our concept of a good teacher. And imagine me, us trying to convince the whole world that this is a bad way of teaching, right? Well, MIT was convinced, and MIT basically said, well, you know what? It's not working, the statistics are out there. So what basically what he was doing is something called pseudo-teaching, right? <coughs> pseudo-teaching is trying to learn to play piano, play a sport, but watching a teacher or a coach. It doesn't work well. That's not how, you know, when coaches teach someone to play uh, cricket or football, the players are the ones doing the playing, right? And the coach is on the sidelines. Imagine if the, the entire game of coaching football was a player, the coach running around on the field, and the players were sitting on the sidelines, and suddenly two months from now they had to actually play a game, and they had never touched a football in their life, right? It's not how the, how the real world operates, and yet we've, we've somehow accepted this as the correct way of um, learning in, when it comes to education, right? Because it's our mindset. So what MIT did was to say, okay, we've got to fix this. So they created something called technology-enabled assisted learning, and basically what that is, is a series of tables at which a professor like Levin would come, but he would give them one prompt, one idea, one thought-provoking thing, and then he would tell students, you guys work it out, right? If you need help, we are here to help, but you guys work it out. And that's what this whole thing is all about. So, so they have uh, technology there, they can present there, the kids are literally a series of mini classrooms what it's kind of become. And guess what? The learning the results absolutely skyrocketed. It just went uh, ballistic <laughs> over because this absolutely works. Now, we don't need to do something like this. You can literally take a whiteboard, 
a, a, a cardboard piece of paper and have two students work with each other and give them give them almost the same benefit as this very complex MIT system. And what I'm saying is we have to fundamentally change the way our classrooms are set up if you want to see real learning happening. And so this is just an example, but it doesn't mean it has to be like that. So now here's a media lab at MIT, and you can see the kind of spaces that they have designed where the life component is very, very important. Now I, was, I flipped through some slides earlier, and I want to go back to that just so you can see what the, what the world outside is doing. So here's what Google's offices look like. So if you look at the creative enterprises that are out there, they don't look like what we expect. They don't look like the offices of the past. They don't have cubicles. They don't have places where people are sitting because they figure that much more creative stuff is going to happen when people work with each other in teams or people just have accidental meetings in cafes and places like that. And if you want to have a, 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 a formal meeting, well, there's a door. You can write the name of the meeting at that time and you go in and then that room becomes available for something else. So this is their cafe, it's decentralized, very much like the schools that we designed. And notes that are available for everybody to see. So someone going by is inspired by an accidental note like that. So what we're saying is that the business sector, the creative side of the business sector has already caught on to this. So what we are talking about from an education standpoint is just something that we have to catch up to. But from going back to the core business of what we do as architects, you can't do that if the hardware looks exactly the same. Because once you get to walk through the building, school building, and you created a model, a physical model of school, that is exactly what we were doing in the 20th century, then guess what? The software is also going to look that way. So somehow the other hardware and software people have to come together, which is why half of the people that work with us are actually educators, they're not architects. And, and, and we have to work collaboratively to design literally a new paradigm of ed how education is to deliver. So that, I hope I've provoked you enough to at least ask a few questions. Gosh, for a wonderful and an informative session. I'm sure all of us have got a better insight into 21st century education design and I hope all of you have enjoyed it as much as I did. Last but not the least, I would like to thank KI India, Dorma and Chandra Lamps for supporting education design architects with the event. And before we break out, to make sure that all of you have a great evening, a Saturday evening, after a brainstorming session from Prakash Nair. Um, Please have, have fun. Thank you again. <laughs>